Um, firstly, a big welcome to everyone um, to day four of Education Week and our session on safe hockey. Um, just a little bit of background behind Education Week. The whole idea was to bring together an array of different presenters from both inside and outside Hockey New South Wales to talk on topics that were relevant to our hockey volunteers. And I've definitely got tonight's session at the top of that list um, when we're talking about safe hockey and keeping children and young people safe in mm. um, and around hockey. So um, <clears throat> for those that I haven't met or um, had the pleasure of meeting um, previously, my name's Craig Bede and I'm the Chief Operating <laughs> Officer at Hockey New South Wales and child safety um, is one of my responsibilities at Hockey New South Wales. So after tonight's session, if there is any questions um, or you need a little bit of further information, please feel free to reach out. Um, to help us unpack child safety and the safe hockey framework tonight, we have Samantha Delamata. Um, and we're very fortunate to have Sam because like a couple of our presenters on um, previous nights, Sam's regarded as very much an industry expert in this field. So um, we're going to be very lucky to draw on some of that experience and knowledge um, tonight. Um, Sam's provided some safeguarding services um, to a number of organisations, including Girl Guides, YMCA, Geelong Football Club and has been charged with leading Hockey Australia's um, development and rollout of Safe Hockey, which I think we started almost two years ago, Sam. Mm -hmm. that, yep. time has, that time <laughs> has flown. Um, as I mentioned, child safety is definitely a hot topic um, at the moment with all sports grappling um, with how we ensure our kids um, are safe. But more importantly, and something that um, Sam and I have talked a lot about, is how do we support our volunteers to do that? Um, which is a challenge because we know volunteers wear many hats. Um, we also know our volunteers are very passionate about this topic. So that was one of the reasons we asked Sam along tonight to give you a bit of an insight into what we're thinking and how we can roll out um, safe hockey um, to the Hockey New South Wales network. A brief little bit of um, housekeeping. Um, I have mentioned in the emails um, about this session, we're recording it. Because we're working with volunteers, not everyone's going to be able to get on this session. So we're really keen to be able to record tonight and be able to share it with as many people as possible so the message um, can get around the New South Wales hockey community. So if that means you're a little bit uncomfortable with your video on, um, I won't be offended if you turn it off. Um, I'll also ask just to pop your microphone on mute if you're not talking. Um, I won't take too much more time. I'll hand over to um, our expert, Sam. Um, all yours, Sam. Excellent, thanks. So I'll just um, bring my screen up as soon as yours is out. Excellent. Um, I'm just gonna make sure I've got the right one. Okay, so, um, Thanks for having me, guys, at Hockey New South Wales. It is um, true. We have been working um, in this space for a while together. And so um, there might be people who are here today who have already heard me speak. Um, some may have been lucky enough to hear me speak more than once. Um, there are certainly young people, some of the, the uh, state teams, the under-13s, there are kids in that team who've heard me speak about three times. So um, I will. I have um, had the pleasure of pushing this message around safe hockey for a while now, but one of the things I'm really excited about is each time I deliver, I get to give you something new and more information and we get closer and closer to the end goal. So I'm gonna talk you through um, the, just some general um, principles and background around safe hockey and what we're trying to do, but also where we're headed to, which is really exciting. Uh, so can you just give me a thumbs up, Craig? You can see my screen fine. Okay, excellent. Absolutely. So I do just wanna start by acknowledging traditional owners of the land in which we are all today. And that could vary somewhat across New South Wales. Um, I'm actually in Victoria, it's cold. Winter has arrived far too early for my liking, but I am um, 
coming to you from Wadawurrung country. Um, but originally my um, country where I was born and grew up in was um, Wiradjuri country, Wagga Wagga and um, that area in the Riverina. So I'm just acknowledging wherever you guys are today and the traditional owners. Um, and I'd like to pay respects to elders past and present of those um, of those traditional owners of the land that you were on. I do also want to just take a moment to acknowledge um, if there are any survivors of child abuse um, here today. It is something I always start with because we are going to talk about keeping kids safe from abuse. And in order to do so, we are going to talk about abuse and what that might look like. Um, and it's very important for us to um, start off the session just to let people know that if they have their own pre um, experience, lived experience, that we wanted to acknowledge that and that um, it can be quite distressing. So please be mindful, look after yourself and do something um, afterwards if you find it distressing that um, that is helpful for you. Uh, I'm also available to have a chat afterwards if you have questions that you don't want to share with the broader group and as is Craig as well as your go-to person on Hockey New South Wales. So in saying that, there's also some really exciting things that are coming up um, that we are putting in place in terms of prevention. So um, it's not all dark and gloomy. Um, quick introduction. You've already had an introduction from Craig for me, um, but yes, all that is um, true. I have worked with children and young people for a long time and the work that I am doing around safeguarding is shifting into the sports sector. Um, I'm also a Collingwood supporter and the Bunnies supporter um, and a thick skinned Collingwood supporter, just so you know. Um, so just to move into the session, I've kind of created this um, with a few key messages. I'm going to give you, uh, work through some slides for each of those key messages and then allow you to ask some questions at the end um, as we go. So the first message is abuse in sport happens. It happens more than we know and it happens at every level. And the better we understand the risks, the easier it is for us to eliminate them. We can't pretend it doesn't happen. Um, we need to be really sh um, sharing that message that it does and we need to put things in place. It can be prevented. We are legally obligated to put things in place to prevent abuse in sport and we all have a role to play in this. From the Hockey Australia Board, um, all of our um, state uh, associations and our local clubs and, and community volunteers. Our response is everything. The way we respond as an adult, as a club or as a sport is vital to the survival of the sport. And we'll talk about that in a bit more detail. Safe hockey is both the roadmap and the destination. We're working towards safe hockey um, but this initiative, the project, everything, the kind of framework that sits within it is how we're going to get there. So what is Safe Hockey the destination? It is, Safe Hockey sits within Hockey Australia's National Integrity Framework and it means that young children and young people feel welcome, safe, comfortable and included when they are in the hockey environment. It is a sport where um, children and young people are free or safe from accidents like injuries and bullying and harassment, both from other young people, but also from adults and safe from abuse, physical, sexual or emotional. It, safe hockey is an environment that aims to ensure there are things in place to reduce the likelihood of a child or young person um, experiencing abuse, increase the likelihood of knowing um, if a child or young person has experienced abuse and also increasing the ability to respond appropriately if a child has experienced abuse. So ultimately we're trying to make sure it doesn't happen, but knowing that if it does happen, we know about it and we can respond to it appropriately and immediately. So abuse in sport happens. It can happen during sport, so um, probably less so in on the field, the abuse we're trying we're talking about today, um, but more so training um, before and after matches, during training tournaments, traveling to sport, so maybe on camps or interstate trips, but also in the car between two or more people involved in sport, so coaches, players, managers, or umpires. Um, it can happen from the sidelines. It all, the other thing that we have to be aware of is the abuse might not be happening in hockey, but due to the nature of the relationships that coaches build with young people, um, a young person or a child who is experiencing abuse somewhere else may share that information with someone in hockey. 
So we still have to respond to that, even if that abuse isn't happening in hockey. There are different types of abuse and I sort of categorise them um, as physical abuse, which is an intentional action um, that causes physical harm to a child or young person. It's usually, it's fairly straightforward. Um, sexual abuse, so any act of a sexual nature that involves a child or young person, it includes physical contact, sexual abuse, but it also includes verbal and nonverbal communication. So sending explicit text messages, exposing a child or young person to pornography um, or to sexual acts. Emotional abuse is anything that causes harm to a child or young person's emotional, psychological, social, or developmental well being. So that can include um, uh, threatening, intimidation, um, manipulation, and verbal abuse, but it also includes exposure to family violence. So you hear a lot of stories about people that say, Oh, I'm not violent towards my children, they're in the other room. But that exposure to family violence in the household is actually considered emotional abuse as well. Grooming sits under sexual abuse. It is the actions taken by someone with the intention to sexually abuse a child. It can be isolating them, favoring them, building trust with parents and doing things, putting things in place to increase um, access to that child. And so it's not just about grooming the child, but it's also about grooming family. Sometimes it's about grooming family members as well. One of the things that's really important is grooming itself in most states and territories is, a, is an offence, which means that some children may be being groomed and be none the wiser, and they might not actually be sexually abused at the end of that process. Because if we can um, recognise those behaviours and indicators and respond to them quickly, it will prevent the actual abuse happening. And um, neglect. So the neglect is when an adult fails to provide a child or young person with basic needs. We don't see neglect in sport as so much, although perhaps at an elite level or um, if there is a coach who is overexerting a child or neglect, they're not access, providing access to water or shelter or something as a, it might be the case. But probably more so it would be about kids who are experiencing neglect at home, but the coach or a manager has picked up on that and has concerns about their safety. Um, the risk factors in hockey are the um, relationships that children and young people have with coaches and managers. And this is the case in sport. Those relationships um, are formed over time. They're trusting relationships. Um, as we move into the elite space, there are children who are, or young people who are looking to do anything they can to be picked on teams, to be moving, moving up. And so if the wrong person is in that role, that's actually used as part of that grooming process and manipulation process. Um, so we really want great solid relationships and um, but healthy and safe relationships between children and young people and coaches in the adults that are associated with sport. Sometimes it's player to player relationships that can be a risk factor. Um, and when children are no longer around and not around their parents, they were their overnight trips, camps, all the fun stuff that the kids really want to do, it just increases the risk because there are less adults and no parents supervising those kids or not the child's parents. Um, change facilities, bathrooms, personal cars are environments that are high risk. And again, children and young people with higher level of involvement in hockey, the higher the level, the higher the risk, there's more time out from family and in the sport. And if that person, that perpetrator is, the, is a coach or a um, um, physiotherapist that's attached to a team, then there's more time spent with them. Um, the, play, the fact that hockey is a team sport reduces the risk somewhat then compared to one-on-one, -on -one. but as the, those young people do move up into the elite space, there is, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one coaching and training that is offered, but ultimately it does reduce the risk when you're, um, there is a team sport. So created this um, behaviour bar, I'm trying to capture here um, this idea that it's we, I've just given you those definitions of abuse, but what we see doesn't, it sits on a continuum. And in actual fact, those definitions of abuse are harder to spot, they're harder to recognise, but there's a whole lot of stuff that we would notice beforehand that might lead to us to be concerned about someone's behaviour. So I've talked to a number of young people, including some of the state um, uh, New South Wales teams. Um, I have a consultation group I met with last year of representative young people representatives from a couple of different states 
Um, I've also done a lot of this work with some other organisations that aren't sport and I've captured some, um, I guess, characteristics of different types of coaches and this applies to teachers probably as well, other people in those professional roles. I'm not going to read them all out to you um, tonight, but you will get a copy of this. There is a recording. You'll be able to go back and read them. So some really um, obvious ones. A good, a good coach exhibits safe, appropriate behaviour. They use positive language. They're a good listener. They're trustworthy and patient. They get to know the team um, and they have clear boundaries. And I'm always really pushing for coaches to set their boundaries up front and be really clear um, around boundaries up front. What is and isn't okay? What is and isn't part of their role? Then we sort of have what, they, what some kids will call an okay coach. They're not um, doing the wrong thing, but they're not very good. They might be lazy. They might make jokes about other kids or laugh along with some of the jokes that are being made about the kids in the team. Um, maybe they're disorganised. Um, they don't really know their stuff with some of the, the um, comments that have come back from um, the young people we talked to. A good coach knows their stuff. Um, but they also might be a bit dismissive if issues are raised. So I don't really know what to do with that if someone makes a complaint. Then we have an inappropriate, inappropriate behaviour that comes from a dodgy, a dodgy coach. So there's a whole range of behaviours and it might be um, leading towards sexualised behaviour or it might be around physical, physically um, um, abusive behaviour or emotionally abusive behaviour. It can be harsh punishments, overexerting athletes, favouring certain athletes, um, maybe it's things around boundaries like commenting on a, on, on a one of the team members' um, Facebook posts or something that's not, not nothing to do with hockey. Private messages, um, ignoring club rules, dismissing complaints and not having any real boundaries and not being clear about those. This does not necessarily mean they're breaking the law or they are um, abusing children, but there are some indicators in this behaviour that are concerning. And then there is the bad coach. So that is when that behaviour is abusive and it crosses that line into abusive. Um, using physical force, grooming, intimidating, manipulative, um, or committing that sexually abusive. So actually committing sexual abuse or um, whether that's physically or um, through communication. So it just gives us a little bit to look at. And really, we only want people in those first, in those first columns. And we could probably do some work with the people in the second columns to bring them up to scratch. But um, I actually think that that third column is just as dangerous as the fourth because they are the people that are telling us through, we, there are indicators that we can see aren't okay and we need to be able to respond to that before the, the, those behaviours in the fourth column come to light. So a couple of examples. Um, we do have a lot of examples around sexual abuse because the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse had a heap of resources, a heap of case studies and research that came out of it. And it is relatively common in sport because of the nature of those relationships. There was um, a case around the tennis coach who sexually abused one of the players um, but told her she needed to have sex with him if she was going to get ahead in her career, which is quite a common um, story in these high profile cases. One of the issues here was that when she raised the matter with officials, it wasn't, um, it wasn't handled appropriately. There was a curator of the cricket pitch in Queensland um, who sexually abused a couple of boys in the sheds. And when they, the rest of the club found out, everybody said, oh, yeah, he, he's really creepy. Oh, yeah, you'd never leave your kids with him. The whole, there was a whole, um, whole number of people that felt that way and thought that way, but no one had raised any of those concerns earlier um, that may have prevented some of that abuse taking place. And there was a hockey coach in the UK who sexually abused four boys that he was coaching. And he, he was really, um, this case was really um, profiling the grooming process. So he brought them birthday presents and took them away on trips like camping trips. Boundaries, not, not limited boundaries, favouring, um, getting one-on-one -on -one access, obviously grooming parents to allow them to let him take their kids away camping. So that's sort of the, some of the behaviours we've seen in these examples. Um, I'm going to talk about sexual abuse just quickly for a little bit and throw you some stats because I think it's important, as we said before, the better we understand what abuse looks like in sport, um, the better we can eliminate some of those risks. So um, it can happen in the family. It can happen outside of the family, so um, uncles or family friends, and it can happen in institutions. So that's sporting institutions. It's um, uh, churches, schools, a number of those places. 
we know that one in four girls and one, at least one in four girls and one in seven boys will experience sexual abuse within an institution. Um, I would argue, though, that those stats are, um, one, they're a little bit old, but two, and um, they are only the ones we know about. And that kind of leads me into the next couple of slides. 90% of um, institutional sexual abuse happen, is perpetrated by somebody known to the child. So those of us who grew up in the 80s and 90s and were taught, taught about stranger danger, it's actually quite detrimental because um, not to say that there aren't strangers and there aren't those cases of kids being plucked off the street, but ultimately the, the real dangers were in our homes and in our sports and in our churches. Um, and it takes, um, it, we also know that it will take a survivor between 20 and 30 years to come forward and share their experience um, formally. And so that sort of takes us back to that slide about the stats and that, you know, if people are taking 20 or 30 years to come forward, we really don't know what the prevalence is accurately. Um, this is really important. This lists some of the different um, short and long-term impacts of abuse and it can um, absolutely vary. Somebody who experiences one incident that lasts for about 15 seconds um, may have long-term, um, significant long-term um, um, issues that fall under these categories um, just as much as somebody who experiences abuse over three years. It's there's a whole lot of variables and there's not one way to experience that and for that impact to land. Um, some of the things that I've heard from survivors are stories about not being, you know, somebody who can't, if they're in an elevator and somebody brushes past them, they automatically go into a response like, are they brushing past me to see if they can touch me? And if they touch me again, is that going to lead? Like they can't even be in an elevator with strangers. Or one guy who said, He's so sensitive to the touch of other people that when he gets his change from the in the shop, he always tries to make it so they have to drop it into his hand because when the shopkeeper brushes his hand, it just sends him into an like into a um, you know really distressed response, triggering that trauma that he'd experienced years ago. So you really can't. I mean, these are all really relevant things that might happen, but you can't really predict um, how significant that. Um, long-term response to that traumatic experience might be. The good news is it can be prevented. Experts around the world say, yes, it actually can be eliminated. We can do things that might be a while before we get there, but we really can prevent abuse happening in sport. Um, we are legally obligated. That helps. We have to put things in place right down at club level. They have to put things in place to prevent abuse. So sport plays a really important role in prevention because we are at such a great platform to promote the message of safety, but it's also a community where people keep an eye on each other, where kids feel like they belong to a club and adults know who they are and can keep an eye on each other. So we're actually, um, it's actually set up to be able to do this really well. There are the national principles for child safe organisations. The New South Wales child safe standards are matching these and across the um, different states and territories, there are different um, principles or standards either in place or coming into place. But essentially, these are the overarching rules for Australia and for organisations working with children and young people. They set the scene of what is the standard, what we should have in place to, you know, in order to prevent child abuse happening in institutions. Um, there are laws also across Australia. And what I've done um, in the work that I've done with hockey is we've sort of um, found, we've benchmarked above um, most of the states and territories to put things in place so that there is a consistent rule across all the states and territories rather than having to do things differently. The legislation might differ, but we've sort of gone above and beyond that. For example, we've said that all adults must have a working with children check or equivalent. There are some states and territories where there are exemptions and it gets a bit tricky, um, but we have said if they can, they should. And that's about all adults in um, roles within clubs. Um, people will say, oh, but they don't have, I don't have any contact with, with children. You are in an sporting environment. You can't, I'd be very surprised if anyone can say they don't have, they don't come across or cross paths with children or young people. But at the end of the day, if you set a, you're trying to set a culture of safety, we don't want somebody who can't get a working with children check in the club. So that's why we're asking people to do it. And that's not about all the senior players. That's not every parent having a working with children check, but people in key roles, particularly coaches. 
Um, it's part. It's not the only way to keep kids safe, but it's an important part of creating a safety a culture of safety. All adults must report all concerns of abuse. The policies, um, the legislation says, you know, if you're a mandated reporter, you have to report abuse. And in some states, there's policies, there's legislation that says, if it's sexual abuse, you have to report it. We are putting a blanket rule in place as a policy. It doesn't matter if you're a mandated reporter or not. If you are aware of abuse that is happening to a child or young person connected to hockey, you are required to report it. And the training and education and resources we're providing will help to walk people through that process. It is important that that information is shared and people aren't getting stuck in there or am I a mandated reporter or not. Um, across Australia, grooming online is a Commonwealth offence and in most states and territories it is um, grooming in person is, or if it's not already, it will be um, an offence as well. Organisations can be held legally responsible for abuse that occurs. This now means that um, in terms of civil liability, a club or an association that is an entity, if they don't put things in place to prevent it and it happens, they can be sued. So before I was sort of saying that if we don't respond properly and put things in place, that like our sport really does depend on us doing that because it can very easily come undone for a club if they don't have things in place and um, there are either civil or criminal cases that come out of that. So we all have a role to play. The individual person, individual adults in hockey, regardless of their role, are responsible for their own behaviours um, and, the, and the impact they will have on children around them. Coaches are responsible not only for their own behaviour, but also for setting boundaries and expectations of their team, contributing to the culture and the way in which they respond to concerns that are raised with them. Clubs are responsible for expect, setting the expectations around what isn't okay, isn't okay and what's acceptable, the culture, the environment, making sure the environment is safe, the information and education they provide to both children and young people, but also to the general community. Um, and again, the way in which they respond to concerns and associations at all levels, so both regional, state and um, national, are responsible for the way in which they lead that commitment to safety and through policy, practice, education and culture at all levels at all times. Everybody has a role to play. Um, I'm going to attempt to play a video. Can you give me a thumbs up, Craig, if you can both hear it and see it because this doesn't always work in my favour, but we'll try. Did you see it? No? No. Okay, let's not worry about it then. Um, I will bring you back to that, sorry. It's always nice in theory, but bring that back up again. Okay, we'll try it again. Okay, so. What role will safe hockey play in preventing abuse? So this is really looking at safe hockey, the roadmap. We've talked about that there is legislation and these high, high level principles. There's also international principles about safeguarding children in sport. So they are all well and good at the top, but what is hockey doing and what is safe hockey doing to bring that to life all the way through um, hockey across Australia? So in terms of a roadmap, the first um, reiteration, 2019 saw the first reiteration of safe hockey policies. We delivered training to um, Hockey Australia, to the mm, under 13s, 15s and 18s, coaches, managers, athletes, and um, also to the member associations of states. Then in 2020, we tweaked those safe hockey policies. We can continue to do the face-to-face -face training. It's important for us to start at the top because the only way for this to work is if it is led from the top. And that is the first principle, the first standard in most of those um, sets that we've seen is about leadership. Um, it's also, 2020 also saw the development of the Safe Hockey Community Guidelines. And this was in consultation with community hockey clubs and associations and some young athletes. They are um, on their way. You may not, you won't have seen them yet, but they are designed for you guys, people who are in clubs, who are trying to 
um, work out, this is all well and good, but how on earth am I going to add this to the list of things I have to do or the way, or how do we know what to do at club level? There are, there's a whole suite of um, guidelines that have been created, especially for you guys that hopefully spell out really easily exactly what you need to do and that are available online. So you don't need to print anything off or put anything on the shelf or make anything available or email anything out. The idea is that you will have one website that you can go to and that has everything in there. And I'll, I can't show it to you yet because it's still in the making, but I will um, give you an idea of what's going to be captured in there. So 2021 is really around finalising all of those policies and the, um, and the community guidelines. It's about continuing to deliver training where it's required at both uh, national and state level. Um, but it's also about developing some training modules and access to education modules um, for community uh, clubs as well. And then 2022 is around implementation. So this year is about getting all that stuff available to you online and launching that and letting you know that it's there. And then when we come to 2022, we're going to start to walk you through the things that we need you to do. And really, really slowly, we're mindful that if I sent it all out and said, right, as of next week, you need to put all these things in place and comply, that people would be very angry at me. Um, there's a lot that clubs are having to do already this year due to, like, you know, post-COVID um, sport. Um, and probably there's been a big impact on clubs around volunteers and retaining volunteers. So we've put the actual implementation off. And it's actually some of the stuff that you may have already done by the time you get to the implementation process anyway. But it's all, it will be set out for you and talk you through little bits of things, just little pieces that you can put in place over a period of time. One of the things that we will introduce next year is safe hockey officers. Many sports are bringing into play at the moment a directive around having a child safe officer or a safe hockey officer for hockey um, in their clubs and associations. So next year, we're going to look at recruiting those two associations and the year after, we'll look at clubs getting those in place. We will also provide training and education both to the clubs around recruiting the right people, but also to those um, officers when they come on so that they are not isolated. They have um, a network of people they can go to. They have lots of information and education available to them. It is not okay to just say, who wants to be a safe hockey officer? Oh, I guess I will, because it's usually the person that puts their hand up to everything that says yes. Um, and they're not necessarily the right person, but we will help you find the right people within your club or your broader community to take on that role. Um, and then we will educate them and provide resources to them so that they feel supported in that role. That's not coming just yet, but we'll have all of these other things in place moving towards that in 2022. So Safe Hockey has a set of rules. Um, there are policies and procedures. They have been um, tweaked several times. They've been reviewed by all states and territories and other people to get them to where they are now. Um, the version about to roll out in the next few weeks with the launch of the Safe Hockey page um, are pretty prescriptive. And I've just been having um, a conversation about in, uh, some investigation training. We were talking about if you don't have policies that explicitly explain what you expect of people, then you can't hold them account to those behaviours. So we really have to be explicit in this, what we expect from people across hockey and those policies and procedures have that information in them. Um, there are a version, there's a version on the Hockey Show website at the moment that you can see, um, but the next version is going to be a bit more um, consolidated and simplified a little bit. So it's again, a little bit easier for people to get their head around. Um, at the moment, that's what it looks like. If you jumped on Hockey Australia's website and went to integrity and you see that where it says um, safe hockey framework, these are those documents. But as I said, there's a new version coming out soon that's even more um, simplified than that. So this is not the fancy page that you will see. This is my pretend version of it. There are actual website designers who are working on this at the moment. But the idea with the safe community guidelines is that there will be a, a button on the page for a number of different cohorts. You go to the one that, that best describes you to get the information that is tailored for you. So I'm not going to make a under nines coach go through all of these policies and guidelines that clubs have to do, things that clubs have to do just in order to get the information that they need. 
they will go to the coach and manager section. They will pick the question that relates to their that relates to what they're looking for, and they'll have easy access. So it's hard for me to explain it just yet because but once it's all up and running, there will be information um, sessions and introduction videos to help give you a tour of how it all works. But the idea is that a young athlete can come in here and very easily go, what is expected of me in hockey? This is what's expected of me. What should I expect as adults? Young people have told us, we can't tell you when a coach is doing the wrong thing if we don't know what the right thing is. So we need to tell them, this is what you should expect of adults. And this is what you can do if you don't see that or if you see something else that is um, concerning for you. There is also a page for um, adult athletes. There's a page for families page for umpires and officials and a page for coaches and managers and then there is one for clubs and associations and that has the information that clubs and associations will need to be able to find what the things that they put in place what their role is around preventing abuse in sport um, there is also going to be a button that people can go to at any point in time where they can raise a concern and that then will be filtered out to the appropriate club association or state um, depending on the, on the issue, so that um, we're not asking um, our community to determine, is this a child protection issue? Is this a complaint? What is this? Is it member protection? They just go, I have a concern about this. And then the system will enable them to filter that out in the right way so we can respond to it appropriately. Um, there is a Safe Hockey, Safe Kids code. This is part of the Hockey Australia Code of Conduct, which is, um, um, rolled out at the moment. And this is really just spelling out the types of behaviours, the things that we expect of adults who are working with children and young people. Um, at the end of the day, it's about providing a safe environment where children and young people are um, free from physical, safe from physical, sexual, emotional abuse or neglect. And this is how it's going to happen. It applies more so to coaches and managers or junior coordinators. Um, but ultimately, we want everybody to really, adults to sign off on this and say, well, if I'm, it's not my role, but if I am around kids, I'm happy to do that because it's part of building that culture that everybody has a responsibility. Um, this is something that will come out in a separate document, but just to show you that this is a flow chart that helps to navigate those complaints and concerns as they come in. And there'll be plenty of guidance and support and education for clubs around that. But ultimately, it just allows us to ask those questions. Is this a child safety concern? Is it a complaint? And then what do we do with that? And it spells out each step of the way. Um, and there's a document that unpacks that that will be um, in more detail that will be available as well as part of this suite of community guidelines. So the next piece is just around how we respond if something does happen. Because as I said earlier, it's a really important part of this um, of protecting children and young people. It's nice to think we won't have abuse eventually, but we must expect that it may happen and our response is really important. Um, the way in which we have survivors have told the Royal Commission that um, when they reported their abuse and they were dismissed or not believed or ignored or blamed, it was actually more traumatic for them than the abuse itself. So it's, that's not okay. We really must do the right thing when it comes to responding to um, any issue or concern raised around the safety of a child or young person. I'm not going to attempt to play another video, but if you want to look up, um, Anna Gordon is a Scottish pole vaulter and she tells her story about not, not so much the abuse, but she says the way in which she was treated by her club when she spoke out about her coach and she was um, kicked out of competitions. She was um, turned away from tournaments. She actually had to leave the country and go and train somewhere else because of the way that she was treated by her clubs because she spoke out about her coach. Um, it's, it's hard when somebody is that we know has been, there's an allegation made about somebody that we know, but we also know that children and young people very rarely make this stuff up. And so it is really important that they are believed in the first instance, um, and then it is left to the authorities to determine whether or not what, what they're um, alleging has happened. So we've got to, we have to accept that we can do a whole lot of things to minimise risk, but we cannot completely prevent abuse. And um, due to the nature of sporting environment and the relationship with co that coaches have, it just might mean that a coach is, um, has information that they need about abuse that they need to respond to. 
if abuse comes, if, a, if um, any information about abuse comes to um, you, it's either a disclosure, an allegation or a suspicion. So a disclosure is basically when a child says this happened to me, an allegation is if they say this happened to somebody else. And the suspicion is when you have reason to suspect something's not right. And that can be based on a number of incidents or indicators in behaviour that instinct, a combination of those things. Most reports that go to child protection are um, suspicions because it's very rare for us to have a full disclosure. As I said, remember that 20 to 30 years that it can take for someone to report it. And it's not usually the perpetrator putting their hand up to let people know that they've um, been committing offences. So um, we really do base a lot of our reporting on suspicion. You do not need to have evidence or proof you need to have what we call a reasonable belief, which is forming a belief um, that it is more likely than not that something happened. And if a child tells you that it did, then you need to report it. We actually don't have the right to decide whether or not it's true based on what they told us. That, that in itself is enough of a reasonable belief for you to be able to pass that on to, to the authorities. I have a list here of indicators of behaviours in children and young people that we might see that might concern us and what they might be telling you. Um, some of them are quite obvious. Changes, significant changes in behaviour, reluctance to participate or reluctance to go home or be left with a specific adult. And it could tell you a number of things. Something's happening outside of hockey, something's happening in hockey. Maybe they're experiencing um, something at home. Maybe they've got some mental health issues. Those behaviours that you're concerned about could be telling you a, a number of things and it's important that we look into that and to address that. Equally, it's important for us to understand those behaviours in adults that are concerning. We, it's very hard to profile a perpetrator. They are not the creepy man in the trench coat at the end of the street. They are um, uh, have different levels of education. They have families. They can be very charismatic. They... Um, in actual fact, a lot of the time perpetrators do are those really charismatic people so that they are, because the whole point is to put people off and so that they are able to commit those crimes. Um, it's hard to profile that, but what we can highlight are some shared characteristics that we've learnt from other, other cases. Often it's around um, pushing boundaries. Many, many survivor stories that we hear, it starts with a hug. So, oh, he hugged me started to hug me and then he hugged me for a bit longer and that's it's surprising how many stories you hear where that's where it started that pushing boundaries around physical touch um ignoring or dismissing rules people and it can't, a lot of the time they talk about things like teachers there was a number of cases where the perpetrating teacher used to park in like the executive car parks he was trying to like push in the rules and he'd park in the car parks and it happens in a number of different um different cases different perpetrators pushing boundaries and ignoring or dismissing rules, showing movies that were MA to kids that were too young, those sorts of things that fit into that category of um, dodgy coach that we talked about. And it can be telling you a number of things. And at the very um, best, it's telling you that they're really naive and they're probably not suitable to be a coach. Um, but at the very worst, that they are a perpetrator of abuse in some form or they're grooming a child in order to do that. So there's a whole range of outcomes, but these are the behaviours that it's really important for us to be picking up on. And unless people know that, then we're not going to be able to, again, we can't rely on the um, young person to disclose to us that it's happening. So we really need to put our own things in place. And just to finish up, these are the six R's that I've been using across all education that I deliver and the policies and procedures and guidelines. It's um, aimed to be able to help people easily work through the process if somebody does come forward with information that's concerning. So if, they rec if you recognise um, through signs or indicators or someone has given you direct information that something's not right, um, the first thing that we ask you to do is to respond appropriately to the person who's coming to you. So if it is a child, let them feel that they're believed, give them a safe space, just hear them out. Don't ask questions. Questions can actually cause issues later on with investigation processes. So um, it, can be, it can be leading or misleading. So it's really important just to let them talk to you um, if, that's, if that's what they're comfortable doing. And obviously to call triple O if there is an immediate risk to safety. 
If you do have the opportunity to record what they're telling you, not with your phone because it's illegal to record children and young people with your phone unless you have their parents' consent. And if you had their parents' consent, you would be stopping that conversation and, and letting them go, their parents take them in to speak to the police or somebody who's more professionally trained for, for interviews. But if they do happen to be talking to you and you're scribbling notes down, um, keep those notes. I have had police officers and sergeants look at this and they've said, if you please tell people to keep your handwritten notes because sometimes we write things down that don't make sense later when we want to summarise it in an email, but that might be really important information for those police. So if you happen to be writing those notes down, please um, scan those handwritten notes, even if it's on the back of a brochure or something, um, take a photo of it and keep a copy of those handwritten notes. Then you need to raise that. You will need to notify parents if that's safe and appropriate, depending on what the, the issue is. You need to tell your club rep, which will eventually be your safe hockey officer immediately and maintain privacy and confidentiality. Um, with support from, support from that club rep, you may need to report it to child protection or the police. And there is that process, that flowchart I showed you before, which will help you with that process. And then debrief. This is not something that people expect to have to do when they put their hand up to coach hockey so or to, you know, run it, sit on the committee. So if you are going through this process, it's really important that you support each other, get outside support if it's necessary, and you can access Hockey New South Wales. Go to them to talk to them about that if you need it. Um, but, and also if the process doesn't work or it falls apart at any point, please let us know so we can make those changes. But hopefully we'll be able to get these resources out to people so there's an easy sort of step that will step you through the, each of those um, stages when responding to something should you be uh, privy to that information. That's Quick it. question, Sam. Yeah. Just okay. back on that one. I had Cathy ask a question around the escalation process and when it moves up through the different levels of hockey and when it gets managed locally? Yep. So if we flick quickly back to my this, it actually talks you through here and that the document will be the responding to concerns guide and it has other pages to it, which gives you more information. But ultimately it talks you through here. So if you're the first responder, when you bring that um, information to your safe hockey officer, how they escalate it to the member, member uh, state association, then if that needs to be escalated beyond there, whether that's independently to someone independent or up to Hockey Australia. So it actually um, provides that step-by-step -step ex explanation around that. Um, what we do say though, is don't wait until it gets to Hockey New South Wales to get the um, go ahead to notify child protection or the police. This step specifically says that if you are the person with the information, get support locally quickly that you can get easily and then you make the report to child protection. It cuts out many middlemen and lost and information getting lost. Um, and you know, if you don't have the right people available to you at Hockey New South Wales, it could be two days before that report is made. So we do really strongly suggest that people make those um, reports as soon as possible and we will have guidance and um, so, and some education around how to do that if you have to do it when you are at um, and that will be available in the community guidelines it's not something that everybody does um, but if you have the right safe hockey officer in place um, they will be able to really adequately support you through that I know we're a little while away from that being the case but that's the idea is that we'll have those um, internal resources in clubs who really have the confidence and the competence to be able to support people to do that process. Another question on the chat. Yeah. Sam, and I know you can answer this because I've seen it, but um, will safe hockey include what's considered low level abuse? Ah, I'm really glad you asked that. Um, one of the things that changed in the most recent version of the policies is that I have introduced um, and it does come up back here in our, where is it? Um, fancy slide, I don't know where it's gone now, is um, that we are introducing low level concerns and reportable concerns. Um, again, like I talked about before, if we could respond to those behaviours that sit in the grey area and we pick those up, then we would be, um, we are better off at, at eliminating the really um, reportable behaviour, those, 
those behaviours of abuse. So what we are looking at is low level concerns, the dodgy stuff, if someone raises that, we're going to register that. We need clubs to put that, if, it might be something that they just are reminded of the code of conduct or they are, um, they are offered some training. So those little things, those little things that might be raised by someone that sits in that, um, maybe the dodgy or maybe the okay coach, so that list of behaviours, if someone raises that concern with your club, we want to keep a register of that because it might be something that's really easy to nip in the bud in the early days and it might not be concerning, but you might also end up with several complaints about the one person that all sits in that low level concerns bucket and um, that in itself becomes a, um, a concern that we want to address. So. Um, the new policies and these guidelines do bring into that um, a way for us to both um, acknowledge and uh, will recognise and then also respond to those low level concerns, things that aren't like sexual abuse or aren't physical abuse necessarily and may not even be reportable to child protection, but that concern us and that somebody has raised so that everything someone raises is being taken seriously in some form or other. I hope that answers your question. That's it for me. That last slide is just to remind us to listen to the small stuff that we that children want to tell us because it might be them testing us and to see if we take their stuff seriously. And if we listen to the small stuff, they're more likely to tell us the big stuff. Another question, Sam, and one that I know I've peppered you on regularly is around image use of children. Ah, so Debbie's old. just asked, yeah. <laughs> that old chestnut. Um, look, there is, the policies do have um, information in there and we have had this discussion a number of times with a number of states. Um, one of the things that gets tricky is when what is and isn't against the law, um, but we can really build a culture where we are mindful of the way in which we use the photos and images of children. The blanket rule is around consent up front from the parents to have their that their child will have photos taken from time to time in hockey and, and that they can be used. And consent from children is really important because some kids don't want their photo taken. And what I've said to, the, um, to those athletes, the state representative athletes I've done education with is if you get your photo taken and it's up on the Hockey New South Wales website because on Facebook page because everyone's really excited about the tournament on the weekend and you don't like that photo that you actually have the right to have it removed even if you agree to have it taken in the first place so you can change your mind around that so we really want to push the rights of children around having some agency around how their images are used um, the other thing that we've talked about Craig um, that we will really be supporting um, associations around is the idea of having um, both the opt out um, um, option when it comes to I don't want my photos of my ch children taken but then exploring that a little bit further to get a better understanding of why and when because sometimes they don't want their photo taken individually up front and put on Facebook but they might be okay with them being in a full group or a team, team photo but when they opt out, they don't get to determine which of those they're okay with. They just opt out. And when you take a, and a kid opts out of a team photo, it can get quite tricky with trying to bring them, make sure they're not in those photos. So um, giving a few more options around the opt out and a little bit more information around that and giving their, the parents the option to come to you and say, this is what I mean by opting out so that you, you can actually better protect that child as well. Um, and then there are just some occasions that you cannot control. And I, I find it really hard because we put all these things in place and rules in place for the sport, but then every parent stands around in the stadium and takes whatever photos they want of whoever they want and put them wherever they want, because that's just what the nature of a public space allows. So I guess my, my thing is around not getting too caught up in the rules about it. Um, having those consent systems in place, but really knowing that there are kids that absolutely need to be protected. Um, and so if we can understand those situations as best as possible to put those things in place, that's important. 
I don't know if that answers your question, but it is in the policies and it's not super explicit because of those variables. Um, but as we learn more and more and get a better understanding of how best to manage those different situations, we will build that into the um, into the guidelines so that you have access to that. The other one I would recommend, Sam, there's some really good stuff around play by the rules. And yeah. they've got some articles on photography and stuff. Yep. So, And I actually think that the community guidelines that you will be um, launching soon will have a link to the play by the rules photos and images um, document in within the information that we've added there's lots of links to play by the rules in that um, pepper throughout those guidelines so you can get more information as well um Kathy had a quick one definition of a child Oh, sorry, you know what, I actually have that slide usually and I don't have it in here. A child um, in this context is uh, up to 12 years old and then a young person is up to 18. So a children and young people we're referring to is anybody under the age of 18, but 12, up to 12 and then between 12 and 18. Any more questions for Sam? If not, I, um, I just want to reiterate one thing you talked to, Sam, which was 2021 really is around education and understanding what's around with safe hockey for implementation really being aimed at 2022. So there really is an understanding of phasing this in to work with our volunteers to make sure we get it right. So really important that we're going to be working hard in 2021 so that you all understand what we're talking when we talk safe hockey to start putting in place in 2022. And then some of the stuff um, Samantha talked about getting down to club level is actually 2023. So a bit like how um, government approached work health safety, where it was very much a staged approach, understanding that there was some considerable requirements. This is following a similar approach. And, but at the end of the day, at least this year, if anyone needs information or has an incident, there will be those things available to go to um, before you actually have to implement it. It still applies and it's there, but we just aren't going to be, you know, um, rolling out any expectations of clubs just yet. Can I throw in some hypothetical scenarios um, I think one of the things that, from my experience, is that stuff happens and we're not, haven't in the past been trained in these things. So you might deal with it, but whether we dealt with it the right way, I think like in more recent times, um, I know in my association, we have a member protection officer now, whereas a little while ago we didn't. Um, before when we had an incident, what well, not a child abuse one, but you know what I mean, any kind yeah. of incident. Um, we dealt with it internally. Um, now we have an independent member protection officer who we can refer certain things to. So that escalation question to me is like something might happen at club level, we might not even know about it. Uh, example, uh, someone takes someone's mobile phone, goes into a change room, takes photo, sends it, to accept all friends on Facebook or something, so all, all invites or whatever, and lots of people see it. Mm -hmm. And no one owns up to who did it. It's mm -hmm. a hypothetical list. Um, or, and they're not under 12, so they might be in the older age group. Um, or it might be the creepy coach doesn't do anything bad, but it's just the language used and a parent complains. Yep. Um, so again, that was dealt with at an associate in this few, quite a few years ago. Yeah. Um, but back this then, was... I don't think things got reported to police or escalated or anything. So it's like, what should be, where's the lines? Um, this will, the new system and the guidelines that are in place will um, allow for clubs to deal with those 
issues, register them so there's a record of them and escalate them. And it will talk you through which ones you need to escalate and whether that's outside to the police or up to Hockey New South Wales or wherever. So it will um, do that because what that does is take the burden and the owners off the club as well. So there aren't a whole lot of volunteers going, trying to sleep at night, thinking about this awful thing that has happened or potentially awful thing that might happen. They're actually able to go, oh, that's not okay. Bang, bang, bang. We've put our things in place. We've escalated it to the right people. Now you can sleep at night. It's actually taking some of that um, off you guys um, and sharing the sharing the load with both your um, member associations or with the police or the authorities. So if that hasn't happened in the past, this process and these policies and guidelines will enable you to do that and hopefully quite smoothly and e easily. One of the things too, Kathy, um, we've worked really hard with Sam on is there's a detailed um, policy and procedure document that sits within Safe Hockey, but we have documentation like flowcharts that is a one pager that helps a volunteer that's seeing this for the very first time to make some good judgment calls early in this process. So we're trying to build those resources for exactly those sorts of scenarios you're saying and um, what we got asked before about what's low level, what's not low level. We're trying to build some resources that really step you through uh -huh. and how to handle those. So, And provide people to go to if you still don't know to get quick, easy answers, yeah. Hopefully that answers your question. Yes. I think the what you said before about creating a role, but often um, then you have to train the role. Yeah, but part of this project is to do that so that it's not up to the clubs to be training somebody up, but there will be, we're hoping to have a whole program that um, all of those safe hockey officers in the region can access the same education and support um, so it's a, it's a little way off yet, but that's the idea. I'm very much against sports telling their clubs to put a child safety officer in and then just hoping for the best because there's actually a real skill set that we're requiring from that person um, and they have to handle some pretty sensitive and important stuff. So um, we really need to make sure we do that right and that we're not relying on clubs to do that, that um, all of the states and Hockey Australia are pulling together those resources to be able to um, educate the right people. We're getting closer to that space. And, and again, Kathy, that's also um, to Sam's point, there's people in the community that have these skills. Mm. So when we can have them in these roles, it makes it so much easier as opposed to like we see often with other volunteer roles, it just gets added to the secretary and the president and you know they just wear another hat. So where we can call on you know, a, a school counselor or um, a social worker or someone who lives in this space um, it's going to give us a far more positive result than um, just throwing it on top of someone else that's already got a mountain of roles and responsibilities. Challenging, yes, we, we absolutely know that. But it's such an important topic that we need to get right. So I know Hockey New South Wales, David, the board are absolutely committed to making this work and that means supporting our clubs and associations. No, I think it needs a, I don't know, an awareness campaign. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, at the moment the in the media, there is a lot of um, conversation around calling out behaviour, reporting um, abuse, whether it's through Grace Tame, who's the Australian of the Year or the stuff that's happening in politics. Um, so I think it's probably good timing to launch Safe Hockey to sort of say, hey, we recognise this might be happening here and we really strongly, we've put things in place, there's information and education here, 
but I'm not, I don't want to just drop that and then go, okay, well, now we're done. We've got policies and stuff. We'll leave. It's actually going to be a three, two or three years before we really get to where we want to go to be able to do it properly. And that's just the nature of rolling things down at such, you know, significant different, different levels as well. I think it's something that obviously all the associations and all clubs care about, and especially clubs with juniors, um, but you get a lot of uh, dads or mums that come to help, and a lot of them are not hockey people, therefore they don't necessarily know the rules or anything like that. But a lot of the stuff is more people complaining about an umpire or this or that. You know, it's complaining over passionate people. It's not but they'll complain about and if someone that the doers in the in the in the community that are actually um, and so I think sometimes what we've done at Seahars we've introduced things like making sure if someone's coaching a junior umpire they're wearing a vest mm -hmm. so that the yeah. role is clear yep some people will do that without the authority or if they last year we introduced marshals and there was a reluctance because people didn't want the responsibility of a marshal. So how you educate is is important. Yeah. And it could take a, a long time before that message is really clear right out into families as well. Yeah. But that's I, why we've got that section for families so that you don't actually have to be part of hockey to get information about what your role is and what to do and why this is important. It's everybody has um, some information. What I'm them. trying to say, sometimes there's a resistance to adopt it. I'm not yeah. saying we won't adopt. I'm just saying some people, because they see it as the extra job and they don't want that job. Yeah. Um, the marshals was an interesting one. I used COVID as the catalyst to allow it to come in because we needed marshals. But mm. the committee itself at the time didn't want to t take it on. But anyway, we made it happen. There's been pushback at all levels, pushback from from coaching, um, from coaches who don't want to be told how to discipline kids because they have their own way. There's pushback at every level. So yeah, I hear you. Um, I'm kind of, I'm used to it now. <laughs> so I'm well, the other thing though, like, Kathy, the Everything. other thing, the other thing too though is um, the New South Wales government will be making this law as well. So there'll be an expectation. It's not, um, can you please, it's you must. So we're trying to get ahead of the curve there to start having this conversation so we can have things in place for when it does become mandatory. Victoria is already that way, Samantha, that yeah. sporting clubs are required to have certain things in place. Yeah. Um, so we know it's coming. Yeah, that's good. All good. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you. All right, well. No other questions? If not, can I thank a few people? Um, firstly, Samantha, thank you for your time tonight. Really appreciate it. Um, very important topic. And um, I think we're very lucky at hockey, um, having seen up close um, how passionate you are about this and getting it right. So I think we're in good hands. Um, but also to all the volunteers that um, took time out of their night to hop on this call as well. So I really appreciate you taking the time as well. You're the start of this snowball. Um, we need to build this snowball so it gets bigger and people understand to your point, Kathy, absolutely there's an awareness um, campaign required. Um, but as you also mentioned, I can't say I've spoken to many people that don't think this is important. So um that makes it a little bit easier. So thank you, everyone. Um, Thanks, guys.